Hey, everybody. This is Mario Dennis with the Keeping It Real Estate podcast. And I have today Matt and Maria Nunez. How are you doing, guys? My, my last name's Wheatley. But yeah, I'm good. you make it sound like a married couple. Hey, listen. <laughs> Everybody knows who you are. <laughs> what is it? Your face sells your place? or My something? face sells your place. Ah, there it is. That's his slogan. <laughs> He's famous in Claremont. <laughs> um, so this is round two. I'm going to be fully transparent with everybody. I had some technical issues that uh, rendered about 20 minutes of discussion um, so <laughs> unusable. So we are doing a take two. Um, that's kind of what happens when you're a one man show, you know, you're a producer, video guy, audio guy, and host. I got to suck up one of them, <laughs> probably multiples. Um, today we're going to talk mostly about I buyers. And so I do mostly open conversation type stuff. And I've done that with both of you, but the I buyer phenomenon keeps growing in the area. And I think I think real estate agents have a responsibility to talk about it and educate the consumer. You know, part of what we do when we um, when we swear an oath um, of ethics when we become realtors is that we we're here for the consumer, buyers and sellers. And so, um, one of the things that the three of us agree on, and there's that there's not enough transparency in the i buyer world. And so, we just wanted to sit down and have a little chat about things that other agents can use when they're meeting with customers and what consumers can use when they're considering some of these iBuyer um, platforms. And so I'll start with you, Maria, because ladies first. Thank you. Um, <laughs> tell me how you're doing and how are you seeing this whole iBuyer thing shaping up? Well, um, basically, I, I'm more of a buyer's agent, so I see a kind of the consequences on the buyer side with them buying up a lot of the inventory that otherwise, you know, first time home buyers would be buying or people looking for affordable housing. Um, you know, they're kind of taking over that marketplace and then reselling at a higher cost. And then when the homes don't appraise, you know, they just expect people to come out of pocket. So they're also, you know, since they're buying up so much inventory and then reselling it, make it, makes it ineligible for a lot of the loans that these people can qualify for so i just see a lot of the the consequences on the buyer side and then on the seller side you know people are just leaving a lot of money on the table for this notion of convenience um, which i don't think is even more convenient than what we can provide when we're operating at our greatest capacity and so i think that's probably going to be one of the good things about the fact that we had 20 minutes of useless, non-recorded <laughs> conversation <laughs> is that some of the ideas that we're talking about are getting a little bit, like I see them with more clarity in my mind. And I think what you just said is hugely important. The notion of convenience that it's advertised is irrelevant if a real estate agent is doing their very best or if you hire the real estate agent that does their very best. Um, Matt, I know when I talked to you in the past about this, you were on every listing that you took, you were um, requesting offers from my buyers and you were doing sort of a side by side comparison and you had a range on, you know, the amount of money that you saw people would have left on the table had they gone with an I buyer. And ha have you continued doing that? And, and do you still see sort of that discrepancy that you saw before? What do the numbers look like? Yeah, I have um, pretty much. Most of the homes that I deal with are between two to four or five hundred thousand, which is exactly the range they seem to like because they're easy to resell uh, and they fit a, a large category of buyers. The average, or I guess I wouldn't, don't really want to say an average, but the range, uh, the smallest one was fifty five hundred, and that was on a under ninety nine thousand dollar house, so still a pretty big percentage. Um, and then the biggest one I saw was around 36000 on a $260,000 house. And I want to dissect a little bit um, what you're doing and how that's different from what the final number would be. Because if you're a consumer listening to this and you're saying, okay, well, 5500 doesn't sound so bad, you need to understand one thing. What Matt's doing is he's comparing the actual sales and closed price that you got for these homes 
versus the offer amount from an I buyer. The offer amount does not take into account any requested repairs they do after they perform inspections. Correct. In fact, most of the time, those repair costs are not, they're not asking sellers generally, A, can you fi- fix the leaky roof or can you fix the leaky toilet? They're putting a dollar amount to it and subtracting from, right. from the amount. So the $5,500 number is the, op- the most optimistic case scenario. Correct. But if that's not basically a 100% perfect home, that's likely more than 5500 And me personally, I don't feel um, like I can do the same thing they do with the deception of saying, well, they're going to charge you this much in fees. Whereas when we see their comparisons to realtors, they're saying, you know, at least this much in seller concessions for buyer closing costs. They're saying at least this much for repair costs is what you're going to pay on average. I don't feel right saying that there's a number that they're going to ask for. And that's kind of where I... And that's a very important ethical right. distinction. That you, what you're saying is when you request an offer from an I buyer, they make assumptions about what a real estate agent would charge. They make an assumption about what a buyer is going to request on closing cost contribution. And they make an assumption of what the transaction is going to require in terms of repairs to be able to close and the real estate fees and you are not doing that you are ha- making an ethical choice to say we're not even gonna we're not gonna dip our toe into that pool we're just gonna talk about the offer versus right. the closed price which I, I commend you for and they're like creating a fictitious contract basically on paper they're assuming that a buyer is going to want x amount of repairs they're assuming that they're going to ask for x amount in contributions well if a home is priced right and especially in that affordable price range you could get someone paying full price asking for no repairs asking for no closing costs so they're really kind of presenting a contract that doesn't exist to these people who are inquiring about services and and presenting as if it did. Most of the time, if you price it where their offer is, you'd get multiple offers and possibly get more. So, I mean, and that's true. We see Mm -hmm. that all the time. Right, because, and again, I'm, I'm just trying to be very specific about surmising what you guys say so that the consumer that's listening to this can get a lot of value. And what you're saying is, they're not going out there buying every and every house that's offered to them. They have a very specific box mm-hmm. of what homes they're willing to buy. And the homes that fit in that box generally are the homes that are most marketable in our market. Mm-hmm. So when we're talking, if, if you're a seller, if you're thinking about selling your home and you talk to your aunt and your aunt tells you, well, yeah, I had to do $10,000 in concessions on my ha- house. If your aunt doesn't have a house like yours, that's not the same thing because your aunt may have a $2 million house in a neighborhood that only has $300,000 homes, which means she was not in a position of strength during negotiations, which meant she had to be more, um, you know, she had to be a little looser with what she was willing to stick to. Whereas the I buyers are buying the cream of the crops, the house this, that everybody wants. So in those price points, sellers can stay very tight um, with things like repairs or closing cost contribution because generally there's multiple buyers that want those homes, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. For agreed for sure. Um, it, when you're dealing with buyers, are you seeing their service be... Um, in comparison to the average agent do you see it about the same do you think they are providing a better service like are they working nine to five or are they very responsive or like how's that process looking like since you work mostly with buyers they definitely work weekends and and nights so they don't have the traditional nine to five schedule and if the your point of contact isn't available they'll have someone else kind of come in and be responsive um the title company that they own and use is not the greatest. Um, so I kind of have fought with every closing to make sure it's had at a physical title company location because I hate a mobile closing. Um, and their compa- their title companies aren't here in Florida either. Mobile there. closing with no keys. Yeah, mobile closing with no keys. <laughs> um, the, so they're, they're not as smooth as it would be a, a traditional agent. And also, they you're buying a house from someone who has no, very little knowledge about the condition of the house. So 
we know they send their people to kind of get more money out of the seller, but they they don't have much to disclose about it because they don't know that much. And so that leaves a lot of room for things to go wrong because you're just buying from an entity who's, you know, changed the locks and the carpet and relisted it. That's a great so. point as a buyer. Yes. As a buyer, when you're entering one of these homes, it's a lot like the REO days in mm-hmm. that these entities, you know, don't, don't spend any meaningful amount of time in the homes. And so the what would normally be a seller's disclosure, the seller giving you the entire story on, on the condition of the home or what's happened in the house and the time that they lived in it is probably not going to be as thorough when you're buying from an eye buyer because they, they're not a person that lives there. They don't have one, do they? Do they don't give you a seller's disclosure? It's like they a, have a one that says don't know on right. every question says yeah. I don't know. So yeah, you, so, so you don't know. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> yeah, super don't interesting. Know. Yeah, super interesting. Um, another thing that happens uh, oftentimes, I think, when you're on the buyer side is uh, when you're on the buyer side and you're working with them as sellers. What I've noticed is um, it's. I've, I've done a couple of deals and I noticed that the title companies, um, because they're not in town, it's the mobile closer with no keys thing, which is an awful experience to begin with. Um, wire instructions generally take a long time. Take to a get. long time because you have to wait for them to set up your file. And so oftentimes they won't get, because they'll be sent after that three business day requirement for us to turn in escrow. So it'll be sent much after that. So it's, it's just difficult to, to pinpoint them, for sure. And when, you're, when we're talking about the appraisal aspect, one of the challenges is the appraisers don't really care what their algorithm says about the value nope. of the home. They do not care. And, you know, sometimes we complain <laughs> about appraisers, but this is the one instance when I'm like, thank you. Because they go and they see wow, you just bought this a month ago for $30,000 less and you did nothing to this house. So what? where are you basing you know, your pricing off of? Um, but then at the same time, it's difficult for the buyers because in my experience, they very little do they budge on an appraisal price. And then they'll send you comps to dispute. Of course, comps never meet the, the lender's requirement for a dispute because, again, these aren't people who are trained professionals. How are trained professionals they're kind of just cogs in this big machine and um and so you know i've had buyers end up having to take to put money on the table and take money you know out of pocket to to get the deal closed i've ha- i've had to give part of my check to make the deal happen because they're just so unwilling to budge and what i explain to people is you are buying a house from wall street you are buying a house from a corporation that has billions of dollars I know to you, eight grand is a lot, and it's a lot to me too, but for them, it is not even a drop in the bucket. So that's why they're being so inflexible with uh, with terms. So Well, that's what happens when you remove the human element yes. for, from things. And so when you remove the human element from, say, like if I walk into McDonald's and I order from the kiosk instead of the person, when you remove the human element from that, you know, probably i'm you know the 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 risk that i'm taking is not that big but when you're removing the human element from a home purchase or a home sale now now you 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 know you're dealing with and the protection yeah protection Mm -hmm. that comes with it for sure and the the human element is huge i mean this is most uh, our clients are the same you know a lot of first-time home buyers this is their biggest investment biggest purchase so emotional Yeah. yeah yeah and when i say the human element i say you know, if the house doesn't appraise, they're probably like, fuck it, it'll appraise in 60 days, put it back on the market. Right. That's, uh, that's how their mindset is. That's, mi- that, that's how they, mm-hmm. they, 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 a company that's looking at Excel spreadsheet and doesn't have eyes on the ground and doesn't have to run into that buyer in the grocery store would probably operate. And so I think that's also an important distinction that when you're entering into an agreement with these folks, you you're probably significantly more vulnerable because you're you you have you don't have a lot of leverage in this transaction they control it all because in the end they they have the big pockets and mm-hmm. and they can sit on stuff longer if need be similar to what maria just said with you know they're not coming out of pocket to make a deal happen 
They don't care. And so what happens is we have an affordability crisis in Central Florida as it is. Our homes are extremely unaffordable. The prices keep going up. And so they're capturing this inventory, holding on to it, reselling it at a higher price, and then not willing to negotiate. So it's taking away opportunities from so many families that could benefit from this. Also because they're relisting so quickly. People who are eligible for an FHA loan, which is probably one of the easiest loans to qualify for, who have their 3.5%, they're completely shut out because they don't qualify due to that um, FHA seasoning rule. So it really is putting a lot of consumers at a disadvantage, and it's not fair. (laughs) And this is all... Uh, and and I don't want to simplify things that are complex, but it seems to me that this is all in the spirit of convenience. That seems to be the big tagline: is convenience. Mm-hmm. This is what they're selling to people. Or or do you think there's more to it than that? I think it. Well, there's there's the deceit factor, which I know we went over before, and I don't know exactly what we've said in between the two recordings, but. Um, The biggest thing for me, like we said, is transparency. So when I go to a listing appointment, if the person knows me or doesn't know me, I'll let them know, like, hey, this this is an option for you guys. It doesn't fit most people. In my my experience, it doesn't fit most people. If it fits you better, by all means, go ahead and take it. Um, But the small percentage of people that fits are either in a huge rush, can't show their house, or maybe just we talked about this before it, it's the money factor mm-hmm. so if you come up and say hey you know there's ten thousand dollars you're gonna be walking away from if you don't want to show your house six times at this price or whatever it would take um that's and it could be more than the ten thousand with the repair estimates too so there's the transparency's not there they compare right because what they're saying is Give us a call today at 1-800-blah-blah-blah-blah-blah, and you can sell your home hassle-free for a convenient price and a time frame that you agree with. And that's all well and dandy. With a fair offer. But but what they're not telling people is the cost of convenience. And, you know, that's one of the things that I think it's it's one of those things that everyone can agree on. Everyone wants more convenience in their life. I want more convenience in my life but I'm willing to pay it to a certain extent. Like I had an oil change on my truck on Monday. And so I went and I drove, drove it to the dealership and I then hitched a ride to my office and then I hitched a ride back when it was ready. Would I prefer someone to come and pick it up at my office and take it back? Sure. Mm -hmm. What if it cost me $20? I'd probably still do it. If it cost me a thousand dollars, Hell no. (laughs) And so convenience is this, it's a word that it doesn't really have a definition because they're not putting a price to it. They're just saying we're giving you convenience, but they're not telling you what the price for that convenience is. And that price could be very much more than you have in your life savings right now. Like how many people in Central Florida that have 10 grand in the bank? Most people do not. And if they and if they do, how long would it take them to save it? It would take them a while. And they're they're doing a good job of taking that or attacking the the realtor as you could say with charging all this money for commission but then hiding or not hiding obviously they tell you their fees but they're repackaging yeah they're repackaging it to say hey you know it's quick it's convenient you get this uh, and and it's higher yeah that's the that seems to be the common denominator the common denominator is Sellers are leaving a lot of money on the table. And Mm -hmm. if money doesn't mean anything to you, go sell them your house right now. I mean, really. If it if you won the lottery and you just need to get out of your house and you know <laughs> You're the two percent it works for. <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. You, you're the alleged two percent that it works for. Somebody passed away in your house in your in you know in your family and you inherited a house and it's just too painful to deal with any of it whatsoever might be a good option for you. I know I've been in the, in that exact position and I probably would have taken that option even having been in, because there's an emotional aspect to real estate transactions that there is some that, you know, they're all kind of, they're all very emotional, but there is some that, you know, hit peaks that are too much for people to bear. So there is that. And then maybe if you are building a house, new construction and 
you know, you want to know that you have the house sold, but you don't want to move out of it quite just yet. You know, that might work for that person. Well, that's why they partner with builders, too. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's why they're, they're yeah. all up in there. The other time <laughs> it may have worked, too, was kind of when they started. We talked about this before, too. 2014, 2015, 2016, the appreciation was so high, people didn't really know what their home was worth. They didn't know how much money they were sitting on. Right. They didn't know how much money they were leaving on the table. And equity is fake money. Right. Equity is fake money because it's exactly the same as taxes. Mm -hmm. People that pay taxes on W-2 on average will not be stressed during tax season and would be happy to get a refund, which is money they paid extra and it's given back to them it's not a gift it's money right. that it's and so theirs. many people are under the impression that oh i got my tax refund and this is money i wasn't counting on you're just getting your money back what are you talking right. about <laughs> <laughs> and people that have to cut a check so if you're a 1099 employee and 1099 contractor and you have to cut a check to the irs you are much more careful when you're filing your taxes like you're going line item by line item to make sure everything is correct and i think the same can be said about equity because this is money that comes off the top of the sale, meaning the net result at the end of the transaction is you're getting a check as mm -hmm. a seller. The check is just smaller than it would be otherwise, but you don't have to physically write a check out. I think right. that makes it a lot easier for <coughs> someone to be able to write off five or $10,000 yeah. because psychologically it doesn't feel like you ever even had that money. Exactly. They don't see uh, that exact amount in their bank account. So, you know, they're okay with with the fees being charged, or they just don't know any better. I think that's the key is education, because yeah. people just don't know. Um, n uh, I know we talked about doing net sheets, but having a net sheet for a seller is is huge. You can say, you know, this is how much you walk away with after everything, everything, all in ev everything, just title fees that we talked about, uh, realtor fees, everything included. Your house sells at this price. This is how much you walk away with. And you can take the, the I buyer offer and do the same thing with them. And yeah. say and then you say, here, here's the difference. And most good title companies will have that available on their website. So it's so easy to plug in. And you know what? It kind of teaches you as a realtor if you're not super familiar with what each fee is because you have to input it yourself. It asks you. It teaches you, okay, this is what really comes into closing costs. So instead of you throwing out a percentage, which w isn't really accurate, you're giving people a dollar amount. This is what your closing costs are with me. And this is what they would be elsewhere. And listen, there's two things that I want consumers to understand. The first thing is, if, being, if, if you're skeptical about real estate agents, maybe you had a bad experience, maybe you don't really believe they can do better than I, bu I, I buy or whatever the case might be, give it a shot. There's no money on the line. I know everyone that's sitting on this table right now would sit with any seller for free and go over with their iBuyer, whatever they got from an iBuyer, and bring a, an, a, an actual market analysis and put it side by side and let them decide. I know all of us would do that. I know the majority yeah. of reputable agents have no problem doing that. And also, I would take it a step farther. I don't have a problem putting a house on the market with a $0 cancellation fee if I can't get you the money for your house that's going to net you more than the iBuyer because I'm so confident on it. I am so confident that I can net you more money that I'm willing to say that if I can accomplish that, you can get out of this listing agreement and I've just lost all the money in marketing pictures and whatever yeah. else I did for the house. I think that's a great idea. I mean, I think everyone should do something like that. I really do. Yeah, because... Again, it goes back to information. Things that I buyers, I believe, capitalize on are a few things. One, the the biggest leaders in the industry, the biggest companies, the biggest leaders, are not being um, proactive at educating consumers about their options, and instead they're trying to jump in the pool with them. Right. Meaning. You know, you have very large real estate companies that instead of putting an ad campaign, spending $10 million doing an ad campaign in the Super Bowl that says, hey, 
Have you heard a commercial from an iBuyer that promises you convenience? Here's the truth. That convenience has a cost, generally ten to $15,000 on average, or they can come up with a number because they have their research department to do that. Right. Call a real estate agent from blah, 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 real estate today and find out how much more money you can walk away with. And they're, they're not willing to do that ad campaign. What they're doing is shaking hands with iBuyers and saying, hey, we'll show you as an option when we go on listing presentation. I'm like... Yep, and take and add in fees to more fees, basically. I think it's so grimy, and I think it just that that whole reputation of you know realtors being money hungry and greedy. That kind of behavior perpetuates that. That's where it comes from. Because it, you're just looking at your bottom line. And yes, we work in an amazing industry where it is possible to make large amounts of money and do very well. But at the end of the day, we are here to, to help our community and to serve people and to, to help facilitate the biggest sale and purchase that they'll ever have. And so it's just crazy to me how um, open these people are being with, with um I buyers and it's not like I'm afraid they're going to put me out of business or anything but it's like where is where is the integrity aspect and what if this is just a fad and then in a few years they're out of here but then you've kind of put your entire reputation on the line for this you know going this back is to your that, cost to bear going back <laughs> to that you know how does something that fits two percent of sellers best interests become the biggest money making machine around like how yeah. does that work it, it's purely for profit and greed, right? And it I has un- to be. And like we were saying before, I completely understand because um, it was kind of what happened with Arios. They used agents on the ground to um, get rid of their inventory. And I understand using that, but I think that's one thing to do that and be a facilitator. And I think it's another thing to promote this as being better than, you know, selling in the traditional marketplace. Yeah, is it in the seller's best interest? It's not. Yeah, and that's the part where the REO comparison, like there's a lot of comparisons that that fit the REO model with the iBuyer model that can be, you know, sort of like layered. But then there's a there's the one part where they diverge 180 degrees. The mm-hmm. banks never asked to own property. Right. No. That was never <laughs> part <laughs> of the didn't business. Want that. that was never part of the business plan. <laughs> Here, uh, a concerted effort of the business plan is and I understand giving options to people. I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm nuanced enough as a person and a professional to know there's a place for it. And, I, and I've already numbered out um, situations where I think there is viability for an eye buyer to exist. However, to your point, I, listen, I think it's very difficult to have sort of a fiduciary or a, a loyalty relationship you know, where you're representing the seller's best interest while you're entered into an agreement with someone that may feed you 100 listings or 200 listings, you know, like it's a very tough position to be put in. I definitely wouldn't want to be in that position because, because again, it's just tough. It's tough for me to say that, that if, if I'm representing a seller, that is giving me business for the next two, three, four, five years that I'm not going to look out for them right. when I have to look out for multiple people in, in a transaction. It's just a... It's a moral and It's an a conflict thing. of interest. Yeah. It, it's certainly. It seems that way. It, it certainly a seems that way. huge conflict. And then at the end of the day, too, you know, those of us who are performing highly in our industry, we all know who we are. We're all friends with each other. We all, you know know what you you know what each other sells and what kind of relationship do you build with those people i mean i've definitely benefited and at the beginning when i started i was so against having good relationships with other realtors i was like very antisocial. i just didn't want to put in the time but there is a benefit to having good connections and having good relationships with other professionals that could definitely help your clients um, moving forward and it's like do you really want to tarnish that it's you know? amazing how that works too, by the way. Like yeah. I, I was the same way. I didn't go to any social events or yeah. anything like that. And then now it just, it just seems to, for whatever reason, happen. Like and I have <laughs> met some of the most amazing vendors through those friendships and the most amazing partners through that. So 
I mean, to me, reputation is everything, and I just wouldn't be willing to put that on the line. It's definitely controversial. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's controversial to you say that. different l- values. Yeah, yeah, it's controversial to say the least. And I think my opinion, it, I'm, I'm willing to have conversations to any, with anybody and listen to their side. You have to be open-minded, and, and, sure. and I have, and I've done that, um, but I still think there is a specifically murky aspect to the way iBuyers are operating when they are making assumptions for conditions that don't exist in the marketplace and telling the seller those assumptions. I think that's a problem. And I think we as real estate agents have a responsibility to shine a light on it. And I think, you know, beyond what you said about when you meet with a seller, beyond that, I think real estate agents have a responsibility to be educated about this and to use social media and the platforms that we have to mount a campaign or to, to be able to, to educate consumers in a way that's meaningful and, and, and relevant to what's going on on the market. Because I think part of the thing, again, that I buyers rely on is that the biggest real estate companies are worried about agent count. They're worried mm-hmm. about like we are number one because we have X number of agents and we are number one and oh we are number God. one because we're we grew two steps away from an MLM. I cannot. Um, <laughs> we are number one because we grew this many agents and we are like, and so you know I think I buyers are sitting in the back of the class going like, mm-hmm. oh that's pretty awesome. Yeah, you guys keep doing that. You guys keep worried about well, agent we buy count. All your inventory. Yeah, you keep worrying <laughs> about agent count. You keep worrying about you know who has offices in most countries who. Ha- it's mo- crazy how many distractions are out there for, you know, just even awards or, you know, top producer volume for the month. I mean, people just need no to focus on <laughs> <laughs> people just need to focus on. No, people do care, job, but it's the people homes. that are in the industry. Mm-hmm. So that's the part that consumers right. don't yeah, care. Consumers don't care. No. I, I could. You know what? And I'm probably going to do that. I'm probably going to do a Facebook poll and I'm going to say. You know, how many people on my Facebook care about the fact that I won top agent or in my office or whatever award, you know, because it's something that we use for marketing. But I also think it's something that that the award givers give it additional value that I don't know if it's there. And then more importantly, when companies are so focused on agent count, um, I think that also puts... Right, the focus goes away yeah. from yeah. selling homes or making that process yeah, and that, and, better and, and, or and, training. And that was what m- my conversation with Joe LaRosa, that's what he said. You know, his thing was, you know, you've got to focus on one thing, man. I mean, like, there's right. there, that's pretty much an agreement across the board in on all walks of business that you can't have four priorities. Like, you have to have one. Is it servicing buyers and sellers or yep. is it, you know, growing your agent count or is it, you know, growing relationships with vendors that can feed you or is it showing up to events or is it being a speaker or is it being, you know, what is I've it? I've learned that a lot this year in in terms of, of trying to prioritize my time and what I'm spending it on, for sure. Yeah, because every time you're saying yes to a new endeavor, a new project or a new distraction, you're saying no to something else. Correct. Right. And so... Most of the time, that's what got you where you you were at too. You know, you whatever you were doing for that time, when you replace it with something else, is it worth it? Yeah. I, I like selling homes. Why do people not? I like love selling homes? looking at houses, and people look at me. I love showing houses. It is my favorite thing to do. People ask me all the time, like, "Okay, so now you're a broker. You're building your business. When you're gonna stop selling homes?" Like, I like doing it. Never. <laughs> yeah, I so also, I'm just gonna teach people in my office to do what I do, and hopefully they'll be successful yeah. too. You know. Also, another thing I think people should in, should take into account is exactly how much money these companies have and how much pull they have. And if everyone's been noticing all this talk now about how buyers' agents' commissions are irrelevant and shouldn't be paid, that's coming from somewhere. And there is definitely a connection between the resurgence of the eye buyer and then manipulating the narrative of what they charge and calling it something else other than a commission and then class actions against, you know, buyers commissions. So I think it's all hand in hand. Yeah, there's cause that's how much influence they have. There certainly is, you know, I think for a while, everyone in the industry expected a market shift 
and those of us who like to be more um, critical thinkers and like to you know look outside you know the boundaries of of the field a little bit we noticed that there was a lot of things happening that were not in the market but they were things sh shifts within the industry not in the market right. and i think that's kind of to your point there's a lot of them mm -hmm. there's there's litigation going on at several levels from corporations to associations um you know and and it just all seems to be happening at the same time and you know it, it, could it be coincidence or could it be related you know it'll be interesting to know for sure yeah. and also i feel like you know every time there's some new piece of news or press about an eye buyer everyone freaks out but i don't see that kind of same hysteria from lenders title companies insurance companies but guess what these people all have their own entities they have their own title companies their own mortgage companies and well, their so own insurance companies so i don't i think our vendors too and our partners too need to be helping in that education process with people so one of the things that i think some of them are smarter than others is so some of them do have all those layers mm -hmm. that that are um, their own entities but some they still outsource it and so what you notice is that some vendors are still hopeful that they're going to get a piece of that pie mm -hmm. so they kind of stay quietly behind the grass and all hoping that they're you know they can raise their hand and they can get you know whether it's the title business or the insurance whatever the whichever piece of it it is and i think that's why you don't have so much of a of a why, why everyone in the industry is not moving in unison towards yeah. this education model because some people don't want to do that they don't want to um, draw that line on the sand yeah. scared of the bully on the playground yeah I yeah. definitely get that too but I think they should try to be as involved too because it does affect them and even if they do outsource that they're outsourcing one company and it's probably not going to be yours, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, I don't think, I think part of the problem that we've had as real estate agents over time is that we've relied on others to do the bidding for us in terms of, you know, marketing, large marketing campaigns and education campaigns. And so um, our industry is one that hasn't, I think, um, tapped into the powerful nature of social media fully, mm -hmm. meaning social media as the great equalizer. Because we've, al we've always relied, you know, the association is going to take care of things for us. Yeah, They're going to do the lobbying <laughs> for us. Um, or, you know, or if you're part of one of the big franchises type companies, well, they are going to do the bidding for me. They're going to do the lobbying for us. They're going to take care of things. They are worrying about these things. And, and I think one of the things that we have in common as agents and you as a broker of independent offices is we learn to try to be a little more self-reliant because mm -hmm. there isn't, there isn't, you know, daddy with $10 billion, you know, going out. And to that platform is perfect for it. I mean, I, that's how I got to where I am today. Right. Social media is, is huge. I, I, I always joke about it and I, and I've, come to realize it's actually more of a truth that Facebook is my CRM. I don't email blast people. I'm, I'm constantly. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't create the, uh, hey, here's my new property on the market. Yeah, thank um, you. But no, e even consumers, though, I mean, you get, if you get to engage with them on social media and they follow you and they see your day-to-day -day activities, they see your success stories, they see your closings, you do a great job of that, thank too. Thank you. Um, do you know why, though? Because someone who is connected with you on social media or on Facebook. What are they called? They're your friend. So there's a relationship established, even if you don't talk to them daily, even if you, yep. I have a client right now who we, sh we lived on the same floor of our dorm at FSU 12 years ago. We have not prior to this had not hung out in 12 years. But she chose to call me because yeah. of social media. So 
is tapping into not just your SOI, but your it's SOI, your online SOI, SOI, SOI yeah. which is crazy. I got two stories for you on that one. The first one is similar to yours. A uh, kid I knew from high school, didn't go to high school with him, but a kid I knew from back then, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, whatever it would have been, um, he saw a video I did of a, just a Facebook Live walkthrough, said, Matt, I want to look at investment properties, purchase one the next month. That was as simple as it got. Um, the next one, the people that actually followed my Facebook page for four years and were finally oh finally ready to buy. They said, we already, we always knew we'd use you, but I never knew who they were. Yeah. yeah. And that's and powerful. I, and I think um, to close this out, because I know, you know, we have a heart out of here, but okay. I think things that agents should take from this podcast is Become an expert in educating the people in your social media account. And you don't have to do that by being persistent every single day, you know, posting about real estate or doing videos about real estate and having people on follow you. But but over time, the person call you after 12 years, not because you were hitting them every other week, like, hey, you want to buy a house? You want to buy a house? You want to buy a house? They did that because after following you for X amount of time, you asserted yourself as the expert in the real estate world unintentionally by doing the activities 100%. that you do um, all the time. So agents, exactly agents should be proactive about educating their spheres about things, specifically when we're talking about iBuyers. Yeah. Share stories that your colleagues are sharing on social media. Share them in your page. Don't be scared to talk about this stuff. And so that that is my advice to agents. And my advice to consumers that might be listening to this is if you're very curious about it. If you've talked to an iBuyer, call a real estate agent mm -hmm. who's willing to sit down with you and do a free consultation about what it is that you're looking at. Because unless you have bought and sold multiple homes in the same market, meaning within the last few months, your previous experience doesn't have any, um, any relevant um, any relevant information that you can carry forward to today. Like if you bought a house five years, that versus today is two different worlds. Right. You mm -hmm. know, so you shouldn't be thinking that because you bought a house five years ago, you know everything there is to know about real estate. And, and your online algorithm is probably wrong if you're looking at one of those sites that's telling you yeah. how much your home's worth. Yeah, especially when you're looking at how much your home is worth and then you're trying to figure out whether the same folks that are coming up with the algorithm are paying for it. Like, you know, there's something, again, there's something murky about that as a consumer. Yeah. Right. I'm not I'm t talking strictly as a consumer. If, if someone is setting the price on something, you know, and then they're representing it, I, I, I have a, I have a problem with, with how truthful their representation is of that. There's a lot um, of ways that could go wrong. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like I own a car, but you are setting the price to it and you're paying for it. Hmm. Are yeah. you really giving me the fair market value or are you trying to and make money? And let's yeah. strip the, the online buyer from it. Like, let's strip the, the huge billion-dollar company for it. If some, some person who has cash knocks on your door and says, I'm going to tell you what your house is worth and I'm because I'm the one buying it from you, I'm the one, though, establishing like what that's worth and then charging all the fees on top of it. You'd say beat it, close the door. No one would say yes to that, but it, because it's veiled with, you know, amazing ad campaigns and um, convenient website, all this stuff, it's, you know, wrapped up in this pretty bow and a pretty package. But let's say we took all that away and the mere essence of it is happening. No one would say yes to that. So if me and you went as real estate agents yeah. and you charged them a holdover service fee that was greater than my commission, which w what's the best thing to do? You yeah, know? that you know what? And I, I think that's a great place to end it. If someone knocked on your door tomorrow and told you your house is worth 250, I'm going to give you 250 for it. And you should trust me for it because I'm pretty good at what I do. No one would say yes to that. So don't be fooled by pretty marketing and um, by advertising that, that talks you into thinking otherwise. And understand, I can't speak for every real estate agent out there. 
But I can say with 100% confidence, every reputable real estate agent that I know would be willing to have a sit down with any seller, any time, any place for free with no obligation to give them an education. And so sellers need to be aware of that because I think a lot of people sometimes see, you know, the real estate agent driving around in the Mercedes and they think that person is unaccessible. And so they need to know that that person is probably willing to come to their house for free. To and give it's them hard because this is our job. So right. people think, well, of course you're going to say that because you want to make the money off the house. But like I, like I said before, if an iBuyer is right for you, I can tag my fees under that and charge it to you, but I'm not going to do that. Because it's not right. It's not. I don't feel like it's right, but it's not in your best interest as a seller. So, it is. It, I understand from the outside looking in. I try to look at things the other way quite a lot, and it's definitely. I can e- easily see like, of course, the real estate agents are going to sit down and talk and say they're not very good or they don't fit people or they're really expensive. But these are just facts. Like yeah. everything we've talked about today is just just facts of what we have all experienced, we've all seen, and it. That's why it's so irritating. That's why we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. And here's my concerns. And I always do the same thing. If I was a consumer, would I believe mm-hmm. this real estate agent's telling me this? And again, that's why that's why my premise is just sit down and talk to a good real estate agent right. and see if it makes logical sense. And if it doesn't make logical sense, then walk away with from it. But the last thing that you want to do is not have all of the information before you make right. such a gigantic That's what's decision. Key. Before you leave your thousands of dollars on the table. Thousands. Thousands. Costs. Costly convenience. The convenience that is the most expensive convenience that you will <laughs> probably ever pay for <laughs> is selling to an iBuyer. buyer. And yes. so I agree. I mean, there's like like we said, there's about two percent where it makes sense. And I'm okay if I sit down with anyone to tell them that it makes sense, go ahead and do it. I'm not gonna not gonna just add my fees in. I don't remember what the exact word was, but tag it on or whatever. The yeah, and, and, and I would... <laughs> bake it in. Bake it in, like that's the cupcake. word. You were <laughs> like just a, baking it in. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, and I would and I would go a step farther. Part of the reason why I'm willing to do that is because, and, and people should have a certain degree of trust that I, that I mean what I say and that you mean what you say when you're willing to sit down with people right. is, I want to run into you at the grocery store. I don't want you to hit me with a mango upside the head when you find <laughs> out that yeah, w- w- when you find out that you just turn around that and I was just your home. slick guy who just you know made five grand or ten grand that you were not aware of. And like I can't do that to people because my business is run on referrals. So if I right. do that to one or two people, especially in the age of social media, my business is everyone over. is going to know. I was about to say this is the referral business. You want the repeat. You want their repeat business. You want their friends' business, and that's how it, that's how it snowballs. That's how it builds up. And yeah, and part of the one th- one time you don't do the right job, uh, the right thing, it all comes crumbling down. Part of the thing they capitalize on is that people are not willing to have conversations about their finances openly right. and publicly. So a lot of people will just talk to an i buyer and sell a house to them without consulting with anyone, like a friend or a family or a professional, because financial stuff is sort of sticky for a lot of people and they just don't want to talk about it and they're capitalizing on that. So know what, understand the game they're playing if you want to play in it. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming in, guys. I apologize that take one didn't work out, but I think take (laughs) two was much better than take one. Definitely had. Thank you. Definitely was good. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Of course.